Welcome to Breaking Down Data Kingdoms for Democratized Analytics. My name is Graham Forbes, Principal Engineer in the Data and Analytics part of Sainsbury's. When I joined Sainsbury's, we were several separate companies with different data strategies. It was decided that we would try and merge all of the different offerings into one multi-channel, multi-brand business and move from a place where data was localized, siloed and highly likely to be duplicated to a place where all the data was democratized and available to all analysts. This was part of the formation of Sainsbury's Tech, where all of our IT capability came under one head, Phil Jordan. Sainsbury's is a UK retail business that started out over 150 years ago as a small shop and grew into one of the UK's largest retailers. Sainsbury's is a multi-channel, multi-brand business and consists of Sainsbury's, which is our supermarket, our most familiar brand, Groceries Online, which is the online part of our supermarket, Argos, which specialises in what we call non-food goods, uh, for example, televisions, electronic goods and toys. Two Clothing is our own clothing brand and sold online and within our stores. Nectar360 is the largest loyalty programme in the UK and allows us to reward our customers for more than just the amount they spend, but also for their loyalty over the years. Uh, Habitat was founded in 1964 and is a retailer of household furnishings. And Sainsbury's Bank provides financial products such as credit cards and insurance. So when I joined Sainsbury's about three years ago to build the capabilities for the new Nectar launch, which was mainly the infrastructure, the front-end application and the data science engine, um, which provided the automated decisioning, the earliest challenge was finding all of the data required to support the data science engine. And then, of course, gaining access to it. And just to complicate matters, there was a new piece of legislation called GDPR. So data is both a blessing and a curse. It allows you to innovate, adapt and plan. It also carries risk as the most valuable data is quite rightly strictly regulated. We have about a thousand or so analysts and their data requirements to support, but also our integration partners too, those with whom we share data to allow us to provide the best experiences we can for our customers. We now have a multi-channel, multi-brand strategy, a cloud-first strategy, and our data strategy needs to enable that. So when we're looking for a strategic partner, we notice that Snowflake separated storage and compute. It scaled well, but also separated out network groups. And it doesn't sound like much until you realize we are multiple businesses within a business, one of which is a bank, for example, and they all have different security requirements. Being able to split out the way you get your data, as well as where you store it, and also how you access it means you've got three levers you can pull to get the best solution for each type of challenge. And we had to take a pragmatic approach around our risks because the simple facts are, if your data is too accessible, you violate GDPR and then you lose your business. If the data is too inaccessible, we lose our analysts and our ability to innovate. So our organization strategy, or our data strategy, know our customers better than anybody else. Understand the costs of the decisions we make, and remove barriers to innovation and curiosity. First, we have to define our business in terms of data and function rather than its organizational chart. What it does at a fundamental level is this is the most durable element of a business. We sell products, we have customers, we make sales. So we've made the pragmatic decision to split off the way we look at data from this business structure, and it allows us to assign, assign a data owner to each bit of data in Sainsbury's and each bit of data also has to be classified. It doesn't matter whether it's something from the 1980s mainframe or something that's just been built. There is one owner of that data and that one owner defines whether they hold the master record of history or the current record or both. And once you have an owner and a model, you've now got a map to find out who you can go to to get access to a particular piece of data. Now for economies of scale, we've decided the master of historical record should by default be a data warehouse that's highly scalable and supports all the business use cases. To make all these business use cases happen, there has to be a way of highlighting the business, not only where the data comes from and where it's going to and how long it's going to take to source, but also how valuable it is, which means every single piece of data is a product. And that means it requires a product owner. So we have one for customer data, one for sales data, logistics data, et cetera. Now, as long as you've got a product owner, that means you can decide the prioritization and you can build a business case around it, which proves how valuable that data is to the business which means you're no longer at risk of people are looking at your data problem, not having any idea on the return of investment that they're getting for all this data that we're moving around. So we've got a large amount of databases, somewhere around 2000 floating around the business. Um, so once again, once you know who owns the data, you can attach those data sources to that owner. They can be assessed whether it's a duplication 
or whether it's something of value. And then you can make a good hard decision based on that data about whether that data was consumed, switched off, um, or whether it's um, piped into other business use cases. And product owners are empowered to use these value-based judgments to prioritise the workloads. Um, in our terms, that is the what and the why, and work with the engineering teams to deliver this. And the engineering teams are accountable for the how and the when. So they have the ability to self-organise and structure themselves with the right colleagues to deliver that type of work. And we've got 20 of these teams all aligned around our data model. Um, we started with around 10 and we have a group of subject matter experts who these teams can call on for the more technical aspects such as service management or governance. Um, and these are shared resources and they're not really um, required by the team day to day. And these teams that are structured around these data products, we expect them to be long lived because data itself is long lived and we want to maintain a stable of data products for the business to consume. So some of the use cases that we've had on our journey, we have migrated a Nectar 360 warehouse. Um, that was a taking all of the data, remodeling it and um, putting the new data onto Snowflake and using that as our um, main consumption point. Um, we took the financial heart of our business and we moved all of the data processing from its original data store um, and data processing to a cloud-based data processing and pointed it into Snowflake rather than the existing database as a parallel build. Uh, we have the new Nectar platform, um, which is a combination of the data sources that we have around the business in a cloud-based application with a data science engine and a live transaction stream. And the live transaction stream not only powers new Nectar, but it also powers any business use cases coming off Snowflake. For example, um, we're using tasks and stream for tasks and streams within Snowflake for the transaction stream data as well as clickstream data coming from our website. And this has been enabled by the fact that our relationship with Snowflake means that we have a team of experts, similar to the subject matter experts we have from Snowflake, who come and advise us about specific tasks, and an RSA who has been truly instrumental in helping us make this transition. So the key takeaways really is that you do need to empower teams within your business who understand data and understand data processing to do that job. You, they need to be empowered to deliver the data based around business use cases that are valuable for your company, which means you need to give them an operating model which allows them to iterate quickly and safely and focus on delivering that high value data products and use those to enable the change in your business and raise the awareness of data um, and that data maturity within your business. Thank you very much for listening. Welcome to a small fireside chat, which Jenna Donnan from Snowflake will be hosting. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience, Jenna? Hi, yeah, thank you. My name is Jenna Donlin. I'm a product marketer at Snowflake. It's my pleasure to get to ask you some more questions about your migration to Snowflake. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, first, what were the pain points that led you guys to choose the data ownership approach? So some of the pain points were if you have a piece of data that you want to use for, let's say, um, a new idea, it was very hard to find out who you could go to to find that uh, to use that data to get permission to use that data let's say you've got an idea that is i don't know you want to market a um, particular product to a particular audience which requires you um, needing nectar data who did you go to from habitat if you wanted that data who did you go to if you're an argus for that data um, there was no real map of the business um, also, that data covers lots of different areas, so you'd need the permission from every single data owner of the type of data. So let's say for the product, you need from the um, head of product, for the um, customer data from the um, customer data owner, and the customer data owner, because of the way GDPR works, for the collection use case, um, which means you might be talking to the data protection officer who would give you a map to all of those different data owners that you then have to contact individually. Um, it's much um, cleaner if all of that data is in one place and we tag the owner and you say, oh, I want this data set, and then all of the owners flagged up with the pre-approved use cases next to them. And that's, the, that's what we're trying to solve is the fact that um, regulation uh, puts complexity, especially on a business, which is several businesses um, collapsing into one. 
Um, the data was in lots of different places um, and lots of different systems and it, trying to find one piece from one data center, another piece from another data center makes all innovation incredibly complex. That's one of the main pain points. Um, the second pain point is someone, if they do a subject access request, has is allowed by law to get all the data about them. So when you have data scattered throughout a business, that's a very intensive time consuming process. Uh, it's the same with right to be forgotten. So we've got 30 days to comply. And at the moment we hit all those targets, but it's a very, very difficult job. Um, realistically, it should be very quick to go in and find all the information about a particular individual. Um, but the reality is, is that when you've got so many different businesses, this is actually a very hard job and requires a very large team. Um, and it can be quite stressful because of that deadline. So one of the pain points is making our compliance with audit and um, the law much smoother and more automated. Um, we have got the next to 360 business, which had um, four databases, uh, which were relied on for um, things like uh, customer campaigns from um, third parties who we work with. I, I won't name them, but let's just say famous drinks brands, uh, for example. We've also got uh, internally in the business, we've got um, two clothing, we've got Habitat, we've got Argos, um, and all of these other brands that also have their own customer databases. So one, um, which is the food business, was an IBM MDM product. And that uh, is an Oracle backend with um, a custom Java front end, um, which we're trying to integrate with uh, the Argos one, which is a custom platform, I believe with a Postgres backend managed by a third party. Uh, we integrate um, all of our single customer views using another third party. Um, which is Experian. So that means that uh, we have lots of these different data sources scattered around the business containing um, information that if combined, um, not only um, gets rid of a layer of duplication and confusion, but also, again, the previous case for the um, GDPR makes that a lot simpler because we're no longer looking in the seven or eight different systems. We're now just looking in the one. So uh, that's an example of where having all of these different businesses with their own products um, makes the data very complicated to find. Um, we've also got uh, supporting off the side of that of things like custom marketing preferences, which also exist in one database per collection type and per collection use case. So, um, you know, two clothing, Argos, et cetera. So we're, that's what it used to look like. And we're slowly merging those into um, one multi-channel, multi-brand product which allows us to um, manage our customer communication a lot um, tighter. So um, without um, many layers of preferences combining and having to be prioritized. Awesome. Did you learn any lessons along the way in adopting this report or in adopting this approach? What worked, what didn't work? How did you rally kind of the business around this, this kind of change? Um, so yeah, there were a lot of lessons learned. The main lesson was that unowned data um, is very difficult to deal with. Uh, data in, I think we've got something like two to 3,000 databases, depending who you ask. Having that many data sources scattered around your business makes it very complicated for business owners to innovate um, and to work out what exactly they have in their, in their um, um, tower. Um, a tower uh, is something like, uh, for example, there's a retail tower there's a um, digital tower, there's a commercial tower. So these are all um, uh, structures within the company that allows us to focus around a particular um, business direction. So uh, the main thing is when someone wants to do something and says, I really need this data or I really need this, it was, wasn't just a let's go to this one person and this one system. It was let's go to these all of these people, try and find all the different bits and then present it back. Um, so the lesson learned was that, especially under COVID, which is the most recent thing, is when you have a subject matter expert with easy access to all the data that they need to do their job, you can react very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a very pivotal moment for us when we realized that collating all of our data um, in, in one place, the bits that we had allowed us to react very quickly to a, um, a very large swing in shopping habits. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in the previous world, 
it would have involved talking to lots of different people rather than just a single data owner. Um, so that worked really well. The thing that's um, more difficult is that because there's now one person who owns all of that data, their job is a lot more complex. They have a lot of things that they need to be aware of and track. So it is. Um, it takes a very special kind of person to be able to own all that data, understand all the legislation around it, and also balance all the, the um, priorities of the people asking. Um, so it was a huge cultural shift, like it's massive. Um, and we're trying to um, use this to drive uh, data maturity within the business. Um, we want people to understand the complexities around the data and also be able to self-service um, the less sensitive data and be aware of when data is actually sensitive. So I heard as part of your migration uh, to Snowflake, you adopted Data Vault. Can I ask why you did that and, and how it helps you guys? Sure. Um, <laughs> data Vault is a really good way of being able to assign ownership to a particular thing. In essence, it's a heavy, um, it allows you to append. Um, so it's very heavily supportive of write. It also, because it's a vault, you can say that this vault is all product data. This vault is all customer interaction. This vault is all customer sales. This vault is all um, finance and commercial information, for example. So it allows you to map the ownership to the data model. Um, it's more complicated on read. There's a lot more joins, um, but it does mean that all those joins are very discrete. So when you're trying to build a data product, which serves as a function that crosses multiple things, finance is a good example, you can build a number of links. So data vault is hub, um, which is where you write all of the data. You then got your satellite tables, which um, enhances that data. Um, so that builds the data off the keys that you've written into the hub. And you've got the link tables that are at the actual driving engines. They're the things that link data from multiple different satellites and hubs. Mm -hmm. And those link tables are then very traceable. So you can see exactly where the data is, where you've got it from, how complicated it is. Um, and it is it, it enforces not only ownership, but it also allows you to build a map, um, which is business focused rather than data focused. So you don't have to explain a complex data model to the business. You just have to say ownership and then we build a data model to fit the use case. Um, the disadvantages are it is very heavy on compute. Um, it is more complicated to join. So you do have to be, um, uh, you do have to have experts to um, piece the data together. Uh, and you do need to know what data is written where in a timely fashion too. But it does allow us to land the vault data uh, in data vault and then build um, a more traditional star schema model on top of that. And then on the, at the end, a presentation layer, which looks to the business just like it used to. So it allows us to land the data efficiently transform it into a form that is incredibly logical, which is our um, business data vault, where some business rules are applied, and then have a presentation layer that is um, star schema, looks exactly the way um, the business expects, which means we can have different people at different data maturities interacting with the different layers. So we expect the business to interact with the presentation layer in the majority, but data scientists or um, people who want to build new business use cases might want to work with a business data vault where they're no longer constrained by the business view on the data. Awesome. I've been hearing a lot out on the market of, of interest around data vault, but not as many people familiar with the methodology and kind of discovering. So it's nice to hear how businesses are thinking about it, where it's helpful, because it is a little bit more effort and, and you know, want to understand before you dive in um, where you're going to get benefits from that. Just one of the benefits of yeah. using um, Snowflake as a platform is that you've separated the compute out. So whereas Data Vault before was um, load restricted, so all of those complex joins and complex jobs all sitting on the same box where you store the data um, in the sort of traditional data um, world, that goes away when you can split the compute out and you can work out exactly how much that query is going to cost you with all those complex joins. Um, so uh, it, it's a real, um, it's something that was possible because we have got storage and compute completely separated. Um, and the ability to clone um, the data as and when we need it. So those two things allow us to work with those complex models without disrupting production, as well as um, work out exactly how much our approach is costing us to. Awesome. How did your migration to Snowflake go? And, and what 
uh, features did you get to take advantage of like that um, that really helped you? Um, so our migration to Snowflake was actually fairly straightforward once we got over the uh, mental shift that you have to to use Snowflake. We had a lot of skills in the business that were based around traditional data warehousing. Um, and we had to bring in a group of people um, who were experts at software engineering and merge the two disciplines together. So you still need to do data quality. You still need to um, make sure that your code is efficient, but you your code has to be differently efficient um, in Snowflake. So when you have a piece of code um, that runs on a traditional data warehouse, the way to warehouse itself constrains how much it can use because there's a fixed amount of memory, there's a fixed amount of disk. Um, and also the job will be looked after quite often by a database administrator or killer if it gets out of hand or um, will uh, shut the job down if it longs too, runs too long. Um, there's quite a lot of implied management in there. When we move to Snowflake, we are running a warehouse for as long as you want to really. So, you're instead of having a constrained resource, you've now got an unconstrained resource. And this is more of a software engineering problem than a um, data engineering problem um, in the traditional sense, because a database will only have a fixed number of resources, whereas now you've essentially got unlimited resources. So you're taking the SQL skills of a, data, of a traditional data engineer and wrapping that in the event-driven approach from software engineering, which is my job has started, my job is finished, I now need to kill all the resources associated with. So if you think about um, infrastructure's code um, supporting cloud platforms, what you're saying is while my infrastructure has been hit this hard by this many customers scale up, and when it's finished scale down, we had to take exactly the same approach to our data as well, because we now have the ability to run lots of different parallel jobs, whereas before we'd have to sequence them and interleave them in a quite a complex manner. Um, simply because the, of the resource constraints. Um, and the main features that helped us really was um, time travel, because time travel uh, allows us to clone databases at particular points in minutes or seconds, depending on the size of the data, majority of time seconds, which allows us to quickly iterate and apply that software engineering principles to our data processing, which is run lots and lots of different times. So keep running lots of times in the test and devs environments until you've got it correct um, and do that iterative approach. So you can say, if it's a complex thing, you can run it until it works or you can just keep making lots of little changes um, and build up your case until it's finally ready. And you can do this all in parallel with the production system and you can work on production data or production like systems very easily, which um, previously you'd need a secondary database and that secondary database would have to be hosted somewhere. Um, and if you broke it, it would take quite a long time to fix. If it was on-premise, uh, it was in the cloud, you'd still have to essentially fix the database every single time. Making a read replica was expensive. Um, whereas, because uh, the data is essentially the same as Snowflake, it's almost a zero um, cost to clone the data. So there was a lot of financial and um, structural and cultural changes we had to make. Earlier, you mentioned um, one of the pain points was around GDPR, but I also heard that data science was one of the, the areas of exploration that you guys were working on that encouraged the shift. Can uh, mm -hmm. you share any of, of what you've been working on in terms of leveraging your data for data science use cases? Yeah, one of the reasons why um, I ended up on this project was I spent two years building the new Nectar platform. Um, and I started out as an infrastructure engineer, um, but once I built the infrastructure and trained the developers, there wasn't um, much in that to do. Um, and one of the burning um, bits of the platform was we needed a data science engine, which allowed us to uh, select the best offers for our customers and not in a way that um, stretched the customer, but when rewarded them for loyalty and for um, what they actually um what they actually did when they went into a store. So uh, yeah. not trying to shift them to buy other products, but rewarding for products they've already bought. Um, so we were using logistical regression and linear programming. Um, but the main pain point for us was actually getting hold of the data. So we spent two years building what was in, in essence a shadow of what our current data program actually is. So something with the data in the right place, something that had um, processing that 
took the data from where it was and turned it into something very useful for, um, for the business that actually um, scaled out. So that um, the methodology that we use there um, to process the details of 14 and a half million customers every week um, is something that was used as a pattern to enable data science, um, as well as making sure that the data was in place before you started the, the actual um, manipulation and um, proof of concepts. That was a um, project that encouraged this use um, of ready access to data and also encouraged a reusable code method. Um, so that meant that the patterns that we used in that could then be applied to other data science pro, um, uh, proof of concepts too. Product matching is another service where we compare our products with competitors' products um, and even with our own products within our business as well. Um, that's another um, data science platform that's been enabled by all of the data being in one place, i.e. Snowflake. Um, and predominantly, the use cases are based around a business outcome mm -hmm. and they're based around a business case. And they're also provable um, by taking where we were um, and the methods we used compare mm -hmm. that to um, the predictive output and then working out um, the time saved as well as the accuracy and using um, different event and logging methods to provide a dashboard to the business owner that shows them in real time exactly what business benefit that data science engine is um, providing. So my final question for you is more just about the different roles on the team What's, um, I, I think you're an individual contributor. How is that different from like a data owner? How are you guys managing, um, you know, those different roles and responsibilities in day-to-day -day work? So our team is structured in um, uh, uh, a way that helps us with this data ownership problem. So we have around 20 teams. Um, those 20 teams have a product owner. They have a engineering manager. And uh, I think I covered a little bit in the talk where engineering manager is the how and the when and the product owner is the what and the why. So they're kind of the data ownership experts. The um, team themselves uh, consist of a number of data engineers, usually around eight. Um, there are a bunch of subject matter experts um, which support them because your um, workload will uh, change as, as and when you go through um, landing a data source. So when you're initially landing a data source, you might need um, heavy governance input and when you're deploying it you might need heavy governance input again but not in the middle um, so my day-to-day -day as a subject matter expert is normally around providing the strategic options that support the overall program one example is um, designing the amazon infrastructure so that we can land data safely process personal information safely um, and then um, make sure that when we get to the end that it's uh, got the correct measurements around it. One example is we've also got a number of engineers who, um, bearing in mind we're a retail company, not yeah. um, a IT company yet. Yeah. Um, we are taking a retail company on a journey to becoming a software engineering house. This is um, the Sainsbury's Tech, which has yeah. just formed last year. Um, Sainsbury's Tech is a IT company within Sainsbury, so they've drafted people like myself to help them on that journey. People who have um, been doing engineering for 20 or so years to um, take the data maturity and the software engineering maturity um, towards uh, a full ownership from end to end. So it's not a case of this person owns that and that person owns the other thing. Your team owns everything that you do, including operational support um, and or um, any accountability from governance um, or from your customer. So a lot of it is around um, the data ecosystem, the software engineering ecosystem, and um, just plain, uh, this is how a software engineering company is run and how it measures success and also how it rewards its engineers and um, how it delivers good long lasting products to its customers in an automated way. I love it. I love the merge between culture and tech, um, how those two things can be really symbiotic. So with that, I wanted to thank you so much for kicking off the Migration to Snowflake content track. We've got five more sessions coming up. So looking forward to seeing all the great content uh, that you just kicked off for us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.